Okay, I've warned Ian that, you know, he's going to have no time for his talk because my introduction's going to go too long. Um, so Ian did his PhD and his bachelor's at um, ANU, originally coming from Goulburn. He then went over to um, Caltech to be a research fellow with um, Lee Silver. And 40 years ago, he came back to ANU. For the last uh, three years, Ian's been an emeritus professor in the school. Um, and we all have all come to, you know, enjoy being with Ian and, and learning about what he's doing. Um, Ian must be one of the most highly cited people in the university. I was looking up his um, records this morning and he has 35,000 citations and he's cited close to 2,000 times a year, which if you do a quick calculation means that he's cited five times a day. So he has had incredible impact um, on our discipline and that has resulted in him being awarded a fellow of the Geological Society of America. So what does he do? Well, Ian has worked a lot on uh, uranium thorium lead isotopic systems, particularly with the shrimp, uh, looking at zircon inheritance in all kinds of rocks. Um, I don't think he's missed a continent in his work, but he can correct me on that. Um, and he's, he's done a huge amount of work on the micro scale um, stability and disturbance of isotopic systems to look at the age and the origin and the thermal history of the crust. Um, in recent years, he's moved into paleoenvironmental proxies and that's what he'll talk to us about today. Now, in addition to his research, um, Ian, as many of you would know, has spent um, perhaps the last 14 year, uh, years before he retired as the chief scientist at the Australian Scientific Instruments um, group in town. Um, his work in translating the shrimp technology into uh, business um, has ended up in election of the fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. Um, and most recently, he was shortlisted for the Eureka Prize for excellence in interdisciplinary research. Um, right now, Ian is working as the um, shrimp technician, I guess, for, for the lab, but he's, he's way more than that. He advises all of us on projects, how to do things. He's in there um, turning screws, unhooking things, hooking things up and um, making sure that the, the instrument keeps going. And, you know, these are instruments where he's developed sulfur, hafnium, titanium isotope analyses, rare earth analyses, oxygen analyses, and he's commissioned and, and developed both the shrimp one and the, the shrimp two. Um, okay, what more could I say? Well, it turns out that he's also received top supervisor awards and um, he was an amazing co-chair for the Research School of Earth Sciences first Equity and Diversity Committee where he really advanced um, equity and diversity in the school. So I guess one might ask, how does, how does Ian do all of this? And, and I did ask that until I went on a field trip with him. Our field trip involves leaving at 7.30, um, a whirlwind tour where Ian introduces you to not only the geology, but also the history of an area. He also tells you which bakery and which restaurant is the best in particular areas. Um, if you're lucky, you might get 20 minutes for lunch exactly at 12 o'clock. And then you go on, have a, have a meal at one of these great restaurants. And then you are looking at um, information or watching PowerPoints or having a lecture until 10.30 at night. So this is exactly how Ian does it every day. He gets up at 7.30 and goes to bed at 10.30 with full on um, activities in between. Um, so I apologize that I've gone on a bit long, but I realized that um, 
Ian actually never had a proper retirement farewell. And so we actually haven't had the chance to just thank him because he has he's influenced generations of students and colleagues and we've all benefited from his kindness, his persistence, his humour, his little gifts of um, baked goods from Janet. Thank you, Janet. Um, and Ian's rigour and curiosity. Um, and so um, I hope this introduction, although long, goes some way to um, telling um, you, Ian, how much the community thinks of you. So without any more chat from me, um, Ian's going to tell us about the Conodont Geothermometer. Well, thank you, Penny. That it's um, embarrassingly comprehensive. Um, good afternoon to everybody out in cyber world. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to take you on a journey to the land of Conodonts. But um, please don't uh, panic. It's not going to be a talk about uh, paleontology. What I'm going to do is tell you how Conodonts can be used to predict the future. All, uh, pretty well aware by now that uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the globe is warming and it's warming at an increasing rate. This graph put together by NASA from uh, remote sensing shows particularly very, very strong rise in temperature in the land surface, but also a steady rise in the temperature of the oceans. Now it's the temperature of the oceans, which is something that we can aspire to monitor in the past. If you have a look at current oceans, in uh, some places now, the uh, sea surface temperature has risen, risen by nearly two degrees centigrade in the last 120 years. And if you look very carefully at the edge of some of the continents, at the edge of Africa, at the edge of South America, and down in Southeastern Australia, those are the areas where the sea surface is warming at the greatest rate. Now, this is a concern to all of us. If you're looking close to home for evidence of the impacts of this sea surface warming on the uh, biomass or the, the uh, marine biota, you don't have to look any further than the Great Barrier Reef. In the last five years, we've had three of the strongest bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef that have been recorded. If you look at this, you can see that the bleaching is occurring mostly in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef in 2016. Then the following year, those corals up in the north are no longer alive to continue bleaching, so the bleaching has moved further to the south. And then three years later, the bleaching has moved further south again. And what this is showing is the way in which waters off Australia are becoming hotter and hotter as you go further and further to the south. 2016 was actually the record highest temperatures ever recorded in the Australian region. And on this graph, you can see in the colour scale that up around the Gulf of Carpentaria and off northwest Australia, the temperatures up in this region got up over 31 degrees centigrade. Now, I want you to remember that number 31 because it becomes relevant when we start to worry about how raising of the sea surface temperature is going to affect marine biology. Now, we're not the only people who have worried about what uh, the effect of rising temperature might be. The key to predicting future impacts of climate change is knowing what happened in the past. And this is a very good paper that was published in Nature, trying to look at the way in which past changes in um, marine life uh, could be used to predict future changes in marine life as temperatures rose. The thing is though, they only went back a few thousand years. What we really need in order to get a successful idea of the way in which marine life is going to be affected by rising sea surface temperatures, of course, is to go back into the distant past. We are fortunate that uh, this sort of work has been going on for a very long time. Jan Weiser, who is the principal author of this massive summary paper, 58 and a half thousand analyses of marine shells, 
This is, uh, he, he was once a postdoc at RSES way back in the 1970s. He's now working in Canada. But Visor used the, uh, the fact that um, oxygen isotopes in uh, marine animals uh, change with the temperature of the water in which that animal is growing. And he used that idea to make an estimate of the changing sea surface temperature throughout the Phanerozoic. So the Phanerozoic is from the uh, Cambrian through to the present day, a period of around about 500 million years. And he came up with a, an estimate of the surface, sea surface temperature changes over time. So let's just go and have a look at how this thermometer works. Oxygen's got two main isotopes, 16 and 18. And it's the ratio between those isotopes which changes very slightly in solids that are precipitated from seawater. And the concept is very, very simple. You take ocean water, which has a certain ratio of oxygen 16 to 18, and from that ocean water, animals grow their shells or they grow their teeth. And the material which is precipitated takes up the oxygen and the composition of the oxygen in the shell is slightly different from that in the water. The difference is temperature sensitive. The temperatures are tiny though. So what we do when we're actually talking about sea surface temperatures is we express the oxygen isotope ratio in a delta notation <coughs> where the delta 18 is the difference in the 1816 ratio between seawater and this ratio here, 002052, is the reference ratio for modern seawater, and we call that zero. And the delta notation tells you in parts per thousand how much that ratio differs in the sample you're looking at. So if we're looking at a seashell, and if the ratio is 002053, that is 20 parts per thousand higher than seawater. And it's that difference between the seawater and the shell which is temperature sensitive. This has all been calibrated out very, very carefully by a series of experiments by quite a large number of people. And you can see the curves don't always match exactly, but the sense of the curve is the same. So even though you mightn't get the absolute values spot on, you can certainly see changes in the sea surface temperature through time. For the precipitation of calcium carbonate, which can either be calcite or aragonite, <coughs> precipitating from seawater, the, uh, the, comp the um, change in the, uh, in the composition of the calcite uh, by one per mil represents a change in water temperature of about five degrees centigrade. So using that idea, here is the uh, compilation that Visor and his companion put together looking at the changes in estimated sea surface temperatures through from 500 million years ago to the present. And a couple of things will strike you very quickly from that. The first thing that strikes you is the horrible scatter in the data. So if you look at some of these uh, analyses made on brachiopods, temperatures over 60 degrees centigrade down to around about less than 20 degrees centigrade uh, repeated estimates for the same period of time. So as you get into the younger and younger material, the bandwidth of these temperature estimates gets narrower. And what that's showing is that in the younger period of the geological time scale, these temperature estimates are really not too bad. But once you get back into the past, what you find is that uh, the reliability of the carbonate thermometer gets less and less. So is there an alternative? Well, there is an alternative. And the alternative is not to work with carbonate, but to work with phosphate. Now, calcium phosphate, we know as apatite. Anybody doing mineralogy knows it as apatite. And calcium phosphate has an enormous advantage over carbonate, is that apatite is a very stable mineral compared to calcium carbonates. The phosphate group, is actually much more stable than the carbonate group. So the oxygen isotopic composition in phosphates is, prepared, pre, is um, preserved much, much better than that is in carbonates. The temperature equation is similar. You have, in this case, a rise in temperature uh, um, being reflected in a drop 
in the delta 18 O of the phosphate. And the rate at which it drops is about four and a half degrees centigrade for every one per mil change in the phosphate composition. The question is, what can you use as phosphates? What what's, uh, is, is available to us as phosphates? Well, it turns out that phosphatic fossils are not all that common in the geological record. Yes, you can find um, the teeth of fish or sharks sometimes in the geological record, but one of the most abundant of uh, the fossils, or one of the most widespread in time anyway, are these little things called conodonts. Now, down in this corner here, I've got a photograph, thanks to Mark Purnell, who put some conodonts on the head of a pin, just to give you an idea of just how small these little beggars are. And in the future now, you, if you ever get involved in a philosophical um, question of how many conodonts can fit on the head of a pin, I think the answer is going to be about a dozen. So that's a bit of useful trivia that you can put away for the next time you do a trivia night. So why um, look at conodonts and what's the big advantage of conodonts? Conodonts have been used by paleontologists for donkey's years to do biostratigraphy. The, they are very, very widespread in time. They are uh, in the geological record from the Cambrian to the Triassic, which is a period of 350 million years. One of the very, very long lived species. They have the advantage that their shape changes quite rapidly with time. So they're fairly good as a time marker. They're quite common in carbonate rocks and quite easy to extract from carbonate rocks by acid dissolution. They're made of fluorapatite, which is chemically very, very robust. And they have another advantage, and which is a particular advantage to us doing the oxygen isotope work, and that is you, the conodonts change color according to the maximum temperature to which they've been exposed in the rock record. So their color is actually an indication of the metamorphic temperature to which they've been subjected. Now, that also gives us an idea of the potential reliability or otherwise of the isotope compositions. So what are conodonts? Well, there's quite a bit of dispute for many, many years over what a conodont was until in, uh, in the uh, 2000s, uh, a conodont was found as a fossil in Scotland. And this here is a conodont animal. And from that particular fossil, people have made up a whole series of um, reconstructions of what a conodont might look like. This is one of the more benign ones, which is available on the web, and it's probably the most realistic. It's actually a free swimming protochordate, which means it, it has a sort of a backbone, but not really. And in the head region, it has two large eyes. And up in that region is where you find the things that we call conodite fossils. So that's the only hard part of the body. Now, the, the thing is, what are they? Well, it's hard to know what conodite fossils are. They used to be found uh, in, when extracted by acid digestion, one by one by one, and each one was given a species name. Then people started to find conodonts in clusters. So you'd find a cluster in the rock. Now, all those must come from the same animal, even though they've got completely different appearance. So these conodonts, which were given different species names, are actually belonging to one animal, and the nomenclature therefore gets very complicated. It's thought that what these are is the feeding apparatus for these little protochordates. They don't, people don't think they're teeth because they very rarely show any sign of wear at all. But here we have a, an animation by um, Nick Gudemond trying to show what he thinks might be the action of conodonts gathering food into the animal's mouth using these little feed, bits of feeding apparatus. Well, what can you do with conodonts? Well, in 2002, by analyzing bulk samples, and it's a very difficult procedure, um, getting the phosphate oxygen out of conodonts, um, by doing this, some people in the German lab in uh, Erlanger did some measurements of conodont oxygen on a series of samples from the Devonian and at the same time measured the carbon isotopes in the host rocks and found that there was a very close correlation between 
the rise and fall in the delta 18 of the conodonts and the rise and fall in the delta 13 of the, of the host rock. And they interpreted these rises and falls in the delta 18 of the conodonts as changes in the sea surface temperature, which was uh, a very valid interpretation. The rise and fall in this case is the, of the order of about two per mil, which, so that little bump there represents a change in water temperature approaching 10 degrees centigrade. But bulk analysis is very difficult. It's time consuming. And more importantly, it uses very large amounts of conodonts. You need milligrams of conodonts to do a single bulk analysis, which means that there's a big mixture of material that goes into your, into your um, analysis. So you have to combine a lot of species in order to get this to work. We decided in, um, in uh, the early 2000s that there was probably a better way of doing this. And this was work that was uh, initiated by one of our PhD students, Julie Trotter, who was doing work on the, the chemical composition of conodonts. And she approached the shrimp lab and said, would it be possible to do oxygen isotope work? And we said, of course, we'd give it a go. So in 2008, we published our first work on conodont oxygen. And we chose to work on the Ordovician. And as it turns out, the range of compositions that we measured on Ordovician conodonts from the very early Ordovician right through to the end of the Ordovician was um, showing, showed a very, very steady change in the conodont composition. And the equivalent temperatures, water temperatures that we calculated were of the order of 40 degrees centigrade in the early Ordovician, which is amazingly hot, and dropping down to what you might call the Goldilocks zone uh, for temperature, which is the modern uh, temperature range of sea surface temperatures at the equator, stabilizing for about half the Ordovician and then suddenly plummeting at the end of uh, the period. So that, that showed that what we could do would, was get sensible data out of the shrimp. And uh, we published that as a temperature curve for the oceans of the Ordovician. Well, how does the shrimp work and what benefit does it give you over the conventional method? Well, shrimp actually, you can do a, an in situ spot analysis of the conodon. The way we do it is we fire 15 kilovolts cesium, high energy cesium beam at the surface of the conodont. That releases the oxygen from the surface and we inject that oxygen into a mass spectrometer for isotope analysis. Conceptually, very simple. From the point of view of the equipment, we use a little more complicated. But the spots that we can put onto a conodont are very small. Here's these little spots here, around about 30 microns across. No problems at all fitting these spots within a single conodont animal. Or a conodont, we call them elements, actually, a single conodont element. To give you an idea of their scale, there's a human hair on exactly the same scale. We'd have no problems putting spots up and down a human hair, and we've done that for other isotope work, which is really quite fun. So the advantages that shrimp has over this gas source analysis are considerable. You don't have to do any chemical processing. You don't have to extract the oxygen from the conodonts. You don't have to destroy the conodonts in order to get the oxygen composition. We only use five little conodont elements to define the isotopic composition for any rock sample. And that turns out to be plenty. So instead of hundreds, which you use for the conventional work, five, good enough, good enough. It's almost non-destructive. When you uh, zap a conodont, you put a tiny little hole in the surface of it, but the rest of the conodont is there for future work if you want to. It has very high spatial resolution. The advantage of the high spatial resolution, and I'll show you in a moment, it allows you to sample the bits of the conodont which are of the highest quality. And it's quite fast. We can do a shrimp analysis of oxygen composition of a conodont in about seven minutes. So that means that you can get nearly 200 analyses in a working day quite comfortably. So before you get too deeply into conodont analysis, what you have to do is know a little bit about conodont fossils themselves. When you're targeting with a shrimp, you have a choice of which part of the conodont you actually hit with the iron beam to do the measurement. 
So if you know what the different tissue types are within the cone dot elements and how they behave on the own probe and what their chemical composition is, then you can target the ones you need. The three main tissue types in a, in a conodon are albid. The albid forms large crystals and that it has very low trace element contents. When it polishes up in preparation for analysis, it actually looks rather rough, which actually tends to dissuade people from putting an iron beam on the albid. But it turns out that's the best material for doing analyses. The next dominant component, which is there, is highline. Highline is it's very fine grained. So when it's polished, you don't actually see any features on the surface. So this little area down in here, all the way down there, is highline. That has the disadvantage that it has a higher trace element content. Down in the bottom of the conodonts at the attachment point is what we call the basal body. That's something you avoid. You avoid it very much because it's not only full of trace elements, it's also got a lot of carbonates in there. And the last, last thing you want to do when you're doing conodont analyses is do an analysis of an area that has a lot of carbonate. So once we understand what these different tissue types look like on the conodonts, when we have a series of conodonts mounted up for analysis, of course, there's no difficulty in figuring out which part of the conodont you're going to work on. The albid shows up as nice clear material, the highline shows up as milky white, and the basal body a dirty brown. Avoid the dirty brown. Down here, this one down here has got a lot of albid on it, a little bit of highline. You could analyze that cone on anywhere. So what we do with shrimp, of course, is target the best material for the best results. When we, when we mount up the conodonts before they're polished, this is what they look like. These are conodonts which are very, very fresh and they haven't been heated at all. So a nice milky cream color that shows you high quality conodonts. If we look at them in transmitted light, you can see through them and you start to see some of the internal features of these little animal, these little um, tooth-like structures. There's a central, there's a central channel which runs down them, which you want to avoid when you're analyzing. Actually, when you polish them, you can see that central channel. We avoid that. There's the basal body down there. Don't go anywhere near a basal body. It's just terrible for analytical purposes. But if we choose what we want to do, there's a perfect spot to analyze and we'd zap it. So the whole question comes up now. What we're trying to do is measure very, very small differences in isotopic composition between the conodonts from different samples. And one of the things we worried about from very, very early on in the work was whether we would have geometric effects in positioning the conodonts on our sample mounts. So from the very beginning of our study, we decided to do the conodont mounting in this way. What we did was we would put five pieces of our reference material on our sample mount. Around each piece of reference material, we would put a single conodont element from each of seven different rocks. The same seven rocks would be represented on a second circle, a second circle, a third circle, a fourth circle, and a fifth circle. So that would mean that we would have five elements from each rock, seven rocks per, per element. By the time we'd analyzed all these, that's a full 24 hours day work. And that uh, meant that we had a single analytical session self-contained that we could actually then assess. To uh, improve the, uh, the, the uh, to get away from the problem of geometric effects even more, what we decided to do was to mount conodonts, not in a conventional 25 millimeter disc, epoxy disc, but to mount them in what we called our mega mounts. Our mega mounts are 35 millimeter epoxy discs and we'd mount the conodonts in the middle. Now there's not actually conodonts in this one, those are actually zircon samples, but the conodonts would be in the central region of the mega mount. Now what that does is get you completely away from any edge effects and reduces or eliminates geometric bias. The next thing you have to be sure of when you're doing conodont analyses for oxygen is that you're getting the isotopic composition accurate. So the question was, what do we use as a reference material? Well, there's not that much out there 
in the uh, in the world of apatites with known uh, and homogeneous oxygen isotopic composition. So we decided to set up our own standard. And what we did was we got hold of a large number of good sized apatite crystals from Durango in Mexico. We chose a crystal, and it wasn't this one, which was absolutely glassy clear right through, crushed it up into very small pieces, and then sent those small pieces off to a conventional lab run by Christophe Le Cuyer in Lyon <coughs> for conventional analysis. Christophe came back and he said, your piece of Durango, and it's our th was the third crystal we looked at, your piece of Durango 3 has an isotope composition of 9.8 per mil. So then what we did was we went and analyzed sharp, which had been also analyzed conventionally. Now that's bioappetite, it's not mineral appetite. And the conventional analysis for the shark tooth came out 22.3, 22.7. When we used Christoph's measurement of the Durango 3 and we measured the shark tooth, we got an estimate of the composition of the tooth of 22.9, which is with an analytical uncertainty of the measurements by conventional. So we're assuming that there is no systematic bias between measuring mineral appetite and bioappetite. So next is the question of reproducibility of the analyses. This is crucial if we're going to be able to run a long analytical session and actually compare analyses done early in the session with analyses done late. And what this graph shows you is a 24 hour period when we've repeatedly measured the Durango standard. And what you get is a series of analyses which show no time related drift in composition and the standard deviation of those analyses is less than 0.15 per mil. So if we get a standard deviation of that sort of level, that allows us to measure the temperature or the equivalent temperature of the water um, to better than two degrees. So now let's look at the, uh, the practicalities of actually doing conodont analysis. This um, transmitted light uh, cross-polar image shows you the complexity of a conodont in real life. The other thing that we have to deal with when mounting up conodonts is, of course, we have to put these into an epoxy disc and then polish down to a working surface. Now that's all very well when you have a conodont which is nice and flat and just has a, a little horn sticking out one end of it, you lie that down on its side, you can polish that so that you can get right into the middle of it, no problems. But when you get into conodonts like this little group, they become much more of a problem because it's not easy to see from this illustration, but they consist of a flat plate with a very steep ridge sticking up from that plate at right angles. So you can see the ridge here better. Those are cows of things to mount up and it's very, very hard to actually get a good section there. <clears throat> so what often we'll do is we'll break off one little part of that flat plate and then lie the ridge flat down on the uh, on the sample mount for polishing. So that's the practicalities of actually getting in to prepare samples for analysis. So space permitting, once the samples are all mounted up and polished, you'll have plenty of room for at least four analyses on each conodont element. So in this case, this is just one group. There's the standard in the middle multiple measurements of the standard, and then four or five measurements of the conodonts around it. Now, occasionally we'll go to town just for the fun of it to see what sort of isotopic variability we get within an individual element. Here's one where we've done close on a dozen analyses, just moving across between the albert, then down into the high line, and then along the high line. And those numbers are the per mil values that uh, we've got for each one. The uncertainty on each one of those would be about 0.2 per mil for an individual measurement. So the next question is, how do you deal with the data that you get out of this array of conodonts? Well, by the time we've done a sample mount, for any given sample, and this is the, just sample A79, for any given sample, we'll end up with 20 measurements. So we'll end up with five conodonts with four measurements on each at a minimum. So then what we do is we have a look at the per mil values that we've measured on each of the individual spots 
have a look at whether there are any spots which clearly are different from the others and they're going to bias the mean value. Here we've got one which is too high at 20.2, one which is too low at 17.7. .7. They would go out and then we end up with a weighted mean of the um, composition for each of those five elements with the standard error of that mean based upon the internal precisions or the scatter or both. So we end up with one uh, definite number for each of our Kona dots. Then we combine all those together. We do a test on whether those five elements from the one rock give the same answer. And if they do, we then do a weighted mean on the basis of the standard errors. And we get a weighted mean value and an estimate of the standard error in per mil. So then we add in the uncertainty that comes from the measurement of the reference material, put the two together, then multiply out by the student's t, which is the student's t multiplier, which converts one standard error into 95% confidence. And there we end up with a number. So this particular rock we would put on our diagram as 18.85 per mil plus or minus 0.27 at the 95% confidence limit. And having done that, again and again and again and again we end up with a whole series of conodont compositions estimates of the, of the oxygen running through time so this is a data set that we published for the silurium in 2016 to just put that diagram together two and a half thousand analyses 675 individual conodonts 161 rock samples and what we get there is a smooth trend from cool to warm to cool to warm to cool to warm and stable going through the uh, through the uh, solaria. And that's the information we're after. That gives us a very, very good estimate of the sea surface temperatures through the solarium with a with a, uh, a confidence of about two degrees centigrade or so. The last step, of course, in the whole procedure is to take that temperature curve and relate it to everything else that we know about the geological history of the period. All the events which have been recorded in the geological record and then tie in the temperature changes to those events to see whether there is cause and effect. So once again, this is the period of the Silurian uh, when we made that assessment. We were traveling very well with our early work on conodonts until somebody put a spoke in the wheel. James Wheelie and his friends were trying to do conodont analyses on the iron probe in Edinburgh, and they came up with a conclusion which uh, was not very good for us. They published this paper on oxygen isotope variability in conodonts, implications for reconstructing the Paleozoic paleo climate, and they were. Um, very critical of the way in which conodont work was done. Their paper addressed a whole series of questions which they felt from their analytical work that they could answer. Question number one, are the individual conodont fossils isotopically uniform? Another one, are the temperatures measured on the coexisting conodonts and brachiopods in the same rock unit or uh, the same period of time, do they match? Do the conodont compositions get affected by the different acids that you can use to extract the fossils from the rock? Do the species, the different conodont species, have the same isotopic composition if they're in the same rock? And are the comp compositions of the conodonts affected by low-grade metamorphism? And of course, having posed all these questions, the paper provided some answers. They should have asked one other thing. Are the iron probe analyses by conodonts of conodonts accurate. They didn't really address the question of accuracy at all, which is probably the biggest question that uh, should be addressed in such a paper. So here are their conclusions. They decided that the conodont elements were not isotopically homogeneous. They decided that the conodont uh, temperatures never or didn't match the temperatures measured on brachiopods. They decided that different acids would change the composition of conodonts. So you have to be careful what acid you used in separating the rock, separating the conodonts from their limestone matrix. Uh, 
do the coexisting species have the same composition? No, they decided in a given rock, the different conodonts of different species didn't always give the same answer. And the other one was, are conodont compositions affected by later heating? And they decided, yes, they definitely are. So that's a bit of a worry for people who are going to do serious conodont work. Well, Wheelie was a bit strange. <laughs> um, it was a very pessimistic paper, that's for sure. But another thing that Wheelie and others did was they recommended a very strange, impractical way of tackling conodont analysis. They said that it was essential to analyze every conodont element a minimum of 10 times. And they gave an example here. You can see the conodont element there, that's their polished conodont showing up. There's three dozen analyses in that conodont. And you notice that all the analyses are down in this bottom area away from the albid, which is the material which gives the best results. They've done a few in the albid, and then they've come down and they've analyzed high line, high line, high line. And that's a recommendation that you should analyze high line tissue, which Julie Trotter from her chemical work showed is the worst, except for the basal. It's definitely not the place to go by preference. So now let's have a look at uh, the measurements of a conodont in practice. These are those two different tissue types, the albid, which is, looks grainy because it's made of coarse crystals, and the hyaline, which looks very fine um, and polishes up rather nicely, and then that ugly basal material at the bottom, which nobody would go anywhere near. Julie Trotter's work during her PhD at RCS, she looked at the chemical composition of these different types of tissue within the conodonts, and she found that within the hyaline, uh, sorry, within the albid, the oxygen is tied up almost exclusively in phosphate. So the albid is on these diagrams in blue. And this is Fourier transform infrared, looking at the different molecular species which are present. If you follow the blue, it runs almost straight down until you hit the phosphate peak, and then it comes down to baseline again. And she did two different species. The result was exactly the same, phosphate only in the albid. Once you get into the high line, however, that's in the red, you start to get a little peak of carbonate. So a little bit of carbonate here, a little bit of carbonate there, a little bit of carbonate. But when you get into the basal, it's catastrophe. It's full of carbonate and you want to stay away from carbonate. Now I keep saying carbonate's bad, carbonate's bad. There is a reason for that. The reason is, that if you have a precipitate forming from water which contains a mixture of phosphate and carbonate, then the carbonate is going to be around about eight per mil heavier than the phosphate. So what happens if you're measuring a mixture is you get an artificial enhancement of the delta oxygen 18O with more and more carbonate getting into the analysis. So this is something that we are very conscious of when we're doing the, uh, the conodont analyses to try and stay away from material that is carbonate rich. In other words, stay away from the basal body. What we do is see whether we can actually get any bias showing up between the delta oxygen 18O from Highline and the delta oxygen 18O from Albin. So if we went through a whole series of conodonts just this one's just one example where we put some spots on the albid, and you can see the coarse grained albid, and we put some spots on the high line, the fine grained high line, and we compared the isotopic compositions we got on them. Anywhere where the isotopic composition in the high line was higher than the albid is a vertical bar on this graph. Anywhere where the composition of the albid is higher than the high line is a, is a, is a line going down into the into the bottom here. And what you see is there is no tendency at all to get high values in the high line. Now that means that the small amount of carbonate which is in the high line is making a trivial contribution to our analysis, which means in turn that what the shrimp is measuring is the composition of the phosphate. 
Now that's critical when it comes to calculating the, the water temperature because we know the, um, the fractionation between phosphate and water as a function of temperature. If we were going to have to start looking at the problem of pr the presence of carbonate as well, that would complicate the calculation enormously. So let's go back now and have a look at those questions that uh, Wheelie really raised. One of them is, are we getting the same answers from brachiopods and conodonts when you do sea surface ca temperature calculations? He decided that no, you did not. And that was quite correct. Here's that water vision data that we, uh, we collected in uh, 2008, our first study. And these are the compositions that we measured on the conodonts, translated into water temperature. I said in the water vision, uh, sorry, in the uh, end, of the, end of the Cambrian, the water temperature is close to 40 degrees, dropping down to closer to 20 degrees by the time you get to the end of the water vision. This is the brachiopod curve for the same period of time, measured just a few years before we worked on the conodonts. Okay, at the end of the order vision, our temperature agreement is pretty good. But when you get down into the early order vision, the brachiopods are predicting a water temperature which is close to 70 degrees centigrade. Now that is unrealistically high. It's, it's hotter than a hot bath. You certainly wouldn't want to have, be bathing in 70 degrees centigrade water. So the conodont story in the order vision, where the brachiopods are not very well preserved, or brachiopod carbonate is not very well preserved, is much more sensible than the uh, story for the conodonts. The, much, the conodonts are much more sensible than the brachiopod story. Now let's have a look at the question of whether there's an acid effect. Conodonts can be extracted from limestone with two different acids, and they're used in different labs. Some labs use formic acid, which stinks like ants, and the other uses acetic acid, which stinks like vinegar. So you have a choice of what the discomfort you're going to have to put up with when you're doing your mineral separations. So the question is, does it make any difference whether you're using formic acid or acetic acid? The idea is you have to get rid of the carbonate component without attacking the phosphate. Well, we did a study of conodonts in the Triassic. And that study, we consciously mixed samples which had uh, been extracted with formic acid and samples which had been extracted with um, acetic acid. We found absolutely no systematic difference between the conodonts separated in the two different ways. So working with conodonts at relatively high quality, acid has no effect. Acid has no effect at all. What we got, the, the in grey on this diagram, you have the bulk analyses done by other labs. And in the coloured points, you have the data collected using the shrimp. And you can see that the pattern with the shrimp tracks the pattern for the other labs very, very well. <clears throat> there is a discrepancy in here where we did samples from two different places. The sample done in red is from open ocean, which is showing very good, strong temperature variations. And the sample in blue is a continental margin area where deep waters were upwelling to the continental margin and everything is more stable temperature wise and cooler. So we're actually getting an estimate and information on the movement of seawater as well as seawater temperatures. So this particular study on the Triassic, we also did a very large number of different species. So we could use it to check whether there's a species effect. So here on this same diagram is the same sort of data. These analyses out here are the water from the open ocean. And these analyses here are the analyses from the, uh, the basin nearby. Now, those, the, those analyses are extremely closely clustered. So ev everything in that diet, everything there is within one per mil, between 21 and 22 per mil. They're as closely clustered as our analytical precision would allow us to get. And yet they represent a whole range of different conodont species. 
He analyzed 90 different conodonts representing 15 species from 18 different stratigraphic units. And these are the results between 21 and 22 per mil. So all of the analyses of this species plot at about 21.3. The analyses of this next species, just very fractionally different maybe, but the same within error. This species here may be just a little bit higher, but in general, the reproducibility over those 15 different species within a series of rock units closely spaced in time, there is no species effect to be seen. So different species living in the same water, same water level, the same result. Now that's not saying that we won't get differences if we start to look at conodonts that live deeper in the water. Of course, conodonts living deeper in the water and show temperatures which are lower. And in special cases, some of the work we've done shows that. So let's go back to this question now of metamorphism. Diagenesis, low temperature metamorphism occurring after the conodonts have been deposited in their sediments. This is the coloration, a color alteration index uh, for conodonts. It's just one diagram of many, but it's a good one. Nice low temperature conodonts, less than 80 degrees centigrade metamorphism, a nice milky cream color, um, beautifully crystallized, uh, just primary, primary unaffected fossils. As the temperature starts to go up, the, temp the conodonts tend to get a little bit darker in color. So by the time you're getting up over 100 degrees centigrade, they're starting to darken a little bit. The color darkens progressively as you go up towards 300 degrees centigrade. And by the time you get up to what they call color alteration index five, the conodonts are starting to look very unhappy, very, very dark in color. They're obviously uh, the phosphate, the, the um, appetite is being modified by the temperatures. These light colored ones at the bottom, which are color alteration index six, are actually so friable that they'll almost fall to pieces. They're completely recrystallized. The assumption is that that temperature represents anything up to around about 550 degrees centigrade. Now we can see these different types of um, effects on the conodonts when we mount them up for polishing. If you have a conodont which has very low color alteration index, it will polish very smoothly. But if you have a conodont where there's a high color alteration index, it's recrystallized. And you see that recrystallization in the failure of the surface to polish smoothly. So this is not albed. This is completely recrystallized highline. So yes, you do get diagenetic effects. So this is a high CAI conodont. Now that you know the uh, different tissue types, you'll realize that all the analyses that have been done up in this top area have been analyses of Albert. All the analyses in the mid-range here are analyses of Highline. They all look rough because they're all recrystallized. And then down in the bottom here, we have the analysis of one spot that got into the basal, into the basal uh, material. And there are isotopic differences. The Highline has been slightly affected by metamorphism and its isotopic composition is dropped relative to the albid, which has preserved the isotopic composition more reliably. So there's 0.7 of a per mil between those two different uh, compositions. That 0.7 of a per mil, that's an error of three degrees centigrade, depending upon whether you use the albid or the high line analyses to do your water temperature calculation. So let's have a look at a couple of tests that we did to see whether CAI was really a good indicator or otherwise of the reliability or otherwise of the analyses we were doing. So what we did was first, we took a series of samples, all from the same substage, all from very closely spaced together in Italy with CAI numbers from one, which is unaffected by metamorphism, up to nearly five, which is affected by metamorphism over 300 degrees centigrade we got, within error, the same answer for everything. So just because the CAI is high doesn't necessarily mean that your conodont is going to be compromised. So the next thing we did was we went to uh, a series of locations in China, 
where we had conodonts running from one to five, all the same age. And there we found in one location that the composition was drastically different at the high CAI. <clears throat> and that raised the question of whether high CAI in that case was causing a problem. But then we went to a different age range within um, China as well. CAI is from one to six. And the one and six gave exactly the same answer, but the one in the middle of five gave the lower value. And then we noticed that that was a location. The Silong location consistently was giving lower numbers. So that's going to be a temperature effect as much as a, uh, an effect of the metamorphism. So our conclusion is from this is metamorphism causes a problem in some cases, but not necessarily. So what about the question of accuracy? I said the paper by Wheelie didn't even address the question of accuracy. Well, we did our own tests of accuracy because that's critical if you're going to actually calculate sea surface temperatures from your conodonts. So the first question was, can we reproduce the composition of a conodont sample through different analytical sessions? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. So what we've done here is make five different mounts, one, two, three, four, five, and on each mount, we've put two or three samples and we've mixed the samples up so that it means that this sample here was analyzed two different times. This one here was analyzed two different times. This one, two different times. The answers match exactly between the two different sessions. So we can reproduce these compositions within a fraction of a per mil on mean value from one measurement, one session to the next, one mount to the next. So the next question was, well, what happens if we compare the shrimp analyses with analyses of conodonts of the same age from the same location analyzed conventionally? Well, this is where problems started to show up very, very quickly. All the red points are shrimp analyses of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different samples. Those shrimp analyses can be compared to the conventional analysis done in uh, another lab by, this is the actually the Erlangen lab, and their composition they measure is two per mil less than what we measure. Here it's one and a half per mil less. Here it's nearly one and a half, here it's one and a half, here it's one and a half. There's a consistent bias between the shrimp results and the conventional lab. But if you go to a different conventional lab, for example, in Lausanne, Yes, there's a bias, but it's not so big. Or if you go to a third lab, and this is Lyon, the bias is almost negligible. So it's a fraction of a per mil. Now by coincidence, perhaps, it's Lyon that measured our reference, uh, reference appetite for us. So the, the bias between our reference, to, our value of reference to their sample and their, the conodonts that they analyzed is trivial. That means that there is probably a problem with the labs. So what we did was, thanks to uh, Chris Barnes in Canada, we got hold of three different conodont samples, which were, had very, very large numbers of conodont elements. And we divided those samples up and sent them away to four different laboratories and said, please analyze these samples for us and get the best result you can. And at the same time, we sent samples of our Durango 3 standard. So again, the red here are the shrimp analyses of the three different samples. We had two samples, which are about half a per mil different, and then one which is about one per mil different from the others. The compositions measured by the, the labs overseas were disappointing to say the least. But there is a pattern to it. And it's the pattern which is the most important thing. So take the, Kamika, the, the um, work that was done on an iron probe overseas using a different type of iron probe from the shrimp. This, this is produced by the Kamika company. The compositions measured were consistently lower than measured by the shrimp, but the difference between the shrimp values and the stuff from the other lab was the same in every case. And interestingly, the offset is the same as the difference between our measurement of Durango 3 and the measurement of Durango 3 in that other lab. 
So this is entirely uh, an interlaboratory bias um, based upon the composition of the reference material that they're using. It wasn't quite so simple for the other labs. Um, we got one of the labs measured our sample twice and got compositions which were two per mil apart. Now that's catastrophically bad reproducibility uh, within, a, within a single lab. One of the labs made a hash of the measurements. They measured huge uncertainties on two of the samples and actually got a reasonable value out of one of the others and then replicated it and got an answer which was within half per mil. Not too bad. But they tried to analyze the Durango 3 and messed it up. So we got no measurement of Durango 3 from that lab. It's, it's a difficult game, measuring phosphates conventionally and getting them accurate. But then, of course, the obvious thing to do with that sort of question is to normalize the conodont measurements to the simultaneous measurements of the reference appetite in the different labs. And then everything starts to make sense. The two iron probe labs give beautiful reproducibility one to the other. One of the um, conventional labs still struggling for reproducibility, but one of the samples isn't too bad. Here, same struggle for reproducibility. One of the samples isn't too bad. On the third sample, it's beautiful. And then on the other lab, one doesn't agree, one agrees very well. So it's a mess, agreed. But the thing is that it shows that there is not a systematic technique bias between conventional measurement and iron probe measurement. The problem all comes down to bias between the different labs and the difficulty that the conventional labs have in getting good reproducibility, which is a pity, but that's the way it is. So now that we've got all this information under our belt, let's go back to that initial question that I asked right at the beginning of the talk. And that was, how have sea surface temperatures varied in the past? And have those changes in sea surface temperature actually had any effect at all on marine biota? And what evidence do we have of what's happened in the marine system? Well, the order vision is a great place to look uh, to answer this question, because in the order vision, around about the middle of the order vision, there was an explosion in biodiversity. And the paleontologists have known about this for years. And over a period of 20 million years, biodiversity has represented by these very broad bands for different families of animals. Biodiversity exploded. And then at the very end of the order vision was a mass extinction. And some of these species and some of these families disappeared altogether and others were severely hit. So what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at corals. We're looking at bryozoans, we're looking at sponges, we're looking at echinoderms, we're looking at bivalves, looking at trilobites. Well, trilobites didn't like that temperature at all. They were quite happy while, uh, while everything before you got to the, that event. We're looking at radiolarians, we're looking at conodonts, graptolites, nautiloids. Lots and lots of different types of marine biota represented here. Well, you can see where I'm going. We're going to put these two things together. There is the temperature curve that we measured with the conodonts matched up against the temperature curve, uh, sorry, the biomass um, diagram. And what you can see is hot water cooling down. As the water cools, you get closer and closer to the stage where things begin to enjoy the, the cooler water, except for the dear old trilobites, which liked the warm water. They didn't like the cooling effect. They were hit very hard at the end of the order vision. When you get into the Goldilocks zone in here, which is equivalent to the modern equatorial sea surface range, the temperature range, th the biomass is very happy and all these animals lived quite happily in the water system. Then the temperature of the water plunged, you went into a severe glaciation and there's your mass extinction. Now, right at the beginning of the talk, I said, please take note of the temperature of the water in Northern Australia. There's the temperature of the water of Northern Australia at the peak of the marine heat wave that took place in 2016. 
that water is right at the upper edge of the temperature range where the Ordovician biomass was optimal. Any higher temperatures and we're going to lose, you can reverse this diagram, we're going to lose many, many of these species. So we come to the question of what can we show from this work? Well, what we can show is that marine life has been massively affected by climate change in the past. And there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't expect that uh, the marine life will be massively affected by climate change in the future. So what's my take home message from this whole presentation? My take home message is that heating the oceans is going to do a lot more than just kill off the equatorial coral reefs. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ian. And uh, we'll take a few questions. So if you would like to ask questions, please put it in the chat or use the raise hand button. Oh, and there are many clips going around in the room, if you could see it. So, uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, Anthony has one. Thanks, Ian. Uh, lovely talk. I was interested by your comments about the um, appetite taking on trace elements post-mortem. I was wondering if that's used in any way to study seawater chemistry? Uh, I'm not sure, Anthony. It's a question of when in the, uh, the period of time after deposition the trace elements go into the, into the animal. And my suspicion is that it's, it's a fair while afterwards rather than uh, something that's uh, that you see in fresh conodonts. But the best person to answer that one would be Julie Trotter, of course, who did a PhD on this. Thanks. And then there's a question from the chat by Mark. What information do you have to distinguish between open water and restricted basin? Oh, the, uh, the, you can get the, uh, you know the uh, depth of water in which the uh, host rock is deposited, mainly from the lithology of the host rock. So uh, also from the associated sediment. So if you're in very shallow water, uh, you'll get, uh, you'll get uh, a rock type, which is uh, say it's um, reef deposits of some sort where you know that the reef only grows within the photic zone. And you'll also get associated fossils, which are from the photic zone, you'll get uh, pelagic fossils. Whereas if you have deeper water, uh, then you'll, you'll get deep marine sediments. The conodonts are preserved in whatever sediments are being deposited. So even though they don't live at great depth necessarily, they will settle down into deep water sediments. So you've got a good idea about what sort of water depth the conodonts were living in, but not at what depth they were living. Some species are going to live near surface. Some are going to live deeper in the water column. But we find that there are some species which consistently come out cooler than other species uh, within a same rock from different locations. All right, thank you. I will take two more questions. And uh, Andrew, if you can unmute yourself to ask. Hi, Ian, can you hear me? Can, Andrew. Thanks, nice talk. Um, I'm puzzled by your, your 44 degree water temperatures. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm used to thinking of conodont color as, as a thermal indication, th thermal alteration indicator. And, and the, the plot that you showed of, you know, less than 50 degrees being the lowest degree of alteration, you know, you don't have to bury, and these are quite old rocks, you don't have to bury very deeply to get up to, you know, 44 degrees and still have a creamy color in your conodonts. How, how how comfortable are you with those really warm um, water temperature estimates? We didn't like it when we first found them. Uh, it worried us a lot. And one thing we did um, soon after getting those results was we did some concentrated work in the early Ordovician and the late Cambrian. 
and we found consistently through a range of samples from different locations that they always came out at around about the 40 degree mark. So okay. we're assuming that that temperature is a good estimate. So, so I mean, in the field, I've seen Devonian reefs, which are which are later. So you know, your idea of cooling waters being being suitable for reefs makes sense. I've just googled when are the earliest reefs, and there it says earliest um, Ordovician. So, you know, reefs would have had to survive those sorts of temperatures, which you know, based on the arguments you've given, seems a bit unlikely. Um, yeah. If you, if you notice the, uh, the diagram, and let me see if I can persuade this thing to go backwards. Uh, you do have some corals existing all the way through in yeah. that yeah. temperature area, but it's just that it must be a very limited range of species. It's, you get the diversity and the increased biomass once you get down into the, the sweet temperatures. But the, these things, you, you remember that the Cambrian is a period of huge diversification. Yeah. But it's just that when you get into this temperature range in the Ordovician, that's when biomass really takes off. And your estimates are from a wide range of localities, right? Yeah. If, so, you, have so a, if you have a look at these Ordovician localities that I've got plotted up here, you've got Newfoundland, mm. you've got uh, the, the Georgina Basin, you've got the Amadeus Basin, um, you, and there's a couple of locations um, down um, there was a UK location as well, so the, yeah, they come from all over. Mm, thanks. So this was a very this was a very preliminary study, but it, it worked out very well. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Ian, there's a few more questions in the chat about us two online. So from Yuri, did anyone try to make use of calcium isotopes in conodons? Where they complement oxygen? Calcium isotopes. I don't know of anybody who's measured calcium isotopes. All right, and the last question from Laura. Are the rare of element signatures in conodons related to the pore water induced alteration or, are, or were they taken up by the animals? I suspect that they're coming in after the animals have been deposited. But again, that would be a question that, um, that Julie Trotter would probably answer better. We might find that there's an answer to that in her thesis if we actually go to it. Um, but um, the, the fact that they're post-mortem uptake means that it's probably um, taking up trace elements from the environment after deposition. Okay, thank you. And then with that, uh, we we'll end the formal part of the seminar. Please feel free to stay online if you have more questions for Ian. And with that, we'll just give a round of virtual applause. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.